Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody out this morning. We appreciate you being out to the house of the Lord this morning for Tuesday morning truths. And uh, we appreciate everybody. We just about have every row, somebody on every row. We must, must be practicing social distancing this morning. <laughs> so going back, to, going back to the old days. But uh, good to see everybody out. And uh, Glenn, that doesn't look like Mason with you this morning. No, that's not Mason. That's, uh, that's not Mason, is it? Who is that? That's Maddie Kate. Huh? That's Maddie Kate. Maddie Kate. That's your grand, great-granddaughter. Great-granddaughter. And appreciate her being here. Then Ernie's here. Right. Ernie's first time back since he became a grandfather. And uh, I sent him a message yesterday. I thought he'd forgotten where Okeechobee was, man. You know that uh, being, becoming a grandparent to do crazy things to you. And uh, we're certainly glad, Ernie, that everything is well with the baby and the mama. And uh, good to see you again, my brother. But appreciate everybody being out. We're going to get ready to go to prayer this morning. Uh, we got some rain in Okeechobee last night. Everybody get rain a little bit, some. We finally got it. A little bit late, but we got it. And uh, good to see Big D back. Big D went to the Carolinas to visit uh, his daughters. daughters. And uh, glad to see that he made it back safe and sound. So good to see Kim Thompson on this morning. We're missing you, girl. Hope you get to feel better and get back here with us. But let's get ready to get open up in prayer. Don't forget, we got a new cards out. We've got the plan of salvation on the back. We had our altar workers meeting Sunday night at five, and did a good time with that. So let's continue to pray and do what we can, and uh, try to get people to the house of the Lord, get them saved. Amen. Amen. I tell you what, God is blessing. So Ephesians three twenty. Now to him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, uh, according to the power that worketh in us. So continue to pray at three twenty. Thank the Lord, continue to thank Him and pray that uh, these new converts, people that are getting saved, people that have been rededicated, visitors that are coming, uh, we've got people that will be here Sunday that's going to be unsaved and needs the Lord, and I tell you what, man, that's exciting. So let's pray that we continue to see God move. Can you pray for the Ukraine? Can you pray for our country and our government? Well, we're in a mess. Uh, Stephen Bush, our young friend that had been coming, has been sick. And also his mom is at the doctor right now with a bad neck problem. Kathy just got a message this morning from Ruth Crawford. Ruth is not doing well at all. So pray for Ruth and Jerry. And said maybe the, maybe the saddest part of that is that she's lost her singing voice. And boy, she is a singer. And sounds like, sounds like Vestal Goodman. And so pray for Ruth and Jerry. Glenda that had rededicated her granddaughter Maddie has been transferred to a hospital in Florida, has brain lesions. And are they still, where's my baby? Are they still calling that? They were it's something really serious in, in the brain. And uh, she's been here, right? The little baby's been here, right? I, mean, I think it's a, a more, in a, more in the children's church. We, but uh, pray for that little granddaughter of Glenda's. Then Shirley's got her knee surgery on May the 2nd. Boy, that's getting close, you know. And uh, then Mary Simmons, that's Brian's fiance. Her uncle's in the hospital and uh, needing a liver transplant. Her uncle David is battling cancer. And her papa and Nana got health issues. Tony Holland passed away. That's Michelle and Amanda's dad. They'll be having his memorial service. Uh, Chelsea Townsend, that's Eddie and, and Alicia's daughter's got a bacteria in her stomach. Pray for her in the lining. Misty Runyon's granddaughter's back in the hospital. Uh, Teddy and Marietta Hill both been in the hospital with a bad virus. Sylvia Nunez uh, has bad health issues. That's the major and Carla's friend's grandmother. Uh, John Huey's mom had uh, carotid artery surgery yesterday. She's in her 80s, so she'll be in the hospital a couple more days. Huh? I did say his mom. Not his mom. His mom's name's Mary. Oh, she got. He's got a friend named Mary. So my mistake, Big John Huey. But uh, your friend Mary. Then I, I stand corrected on that. Thank goodness for the first lady. Amen. Amen. And then Wandel Meeks was taken to the ER yesterday with bladder and kidney problems, waiting to have surgery on the 16th. More than that, Wandel's not saved. 
Clarence Lowe has cancer surgery tomorrow, and his wife Geraldine had a mini stroke. at Karen Boyd's mom and dad, Chris and Karen. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Your neighbors down there. Madison Hanley, 12 years old, cancer in her femur bone. Pray for her. That's Chris's cousin's granddaughter, Trisha Maxey, that's been here. She has some health issues. Whitney Boswell's sister recently had two surgeries, and her uncle Huey had surgery. Can you pray for Eddie, that he'll have a good, complete recovery? And if you didn't see the prayer list that the First Lady sent out this morning, you ought to go on there and look at it. Pray for those people, multitudes of people, Bill and Shirley on there, the grandbabies on there. Uh, Karen Boyd's dad is having surgery. Who did I say? Karen Boyd's dad is having surgery, so pray for Karen's dad having surgery tomorrow. So we've got a lot of folks, man, a lot of folks that are in need of prayer, and uh, I don't know anybody that doesn't need prayer. Amen? Amen? So let's pray this morning. Lord, we're thankful to be out, thankful to be in your house, thankful for Tuesday morning truce, a beautiful day, and for the rain last night. And Lord, we just pray that you help us as we study your word today. Lord, we'll start into a brand new series, brand new topics. And Lord, I pray that uh, you'll lead us and guide us. Help us, Lord, to do what you would want us to do, be what you'd want us to be. Thank you for our church, all that you blessed us with, Lord, the way you're blessing us with new people. Wow, so many new visitors every week. Lord, what a blessing that is. People being saved and rededicated and renewed. And Lord, we certainly thank you for that. Lord, I pray for every name we called out this morning, every name that's on the major prayer list. I pray that you be with them and help them. Lord, everybody's either in a storm, coming out of a storm, or getting ready to go into a storm. And Lord, I pray for those that are here this morning. Thank you for them that took time to be here. And Lord, we just pray you bless those folks that are online today, Lord, and those that will be watching later. In Jesus' name, amen Amen. and amen. All right, all right, all right. So here we go. We're going to start a brand new series today. We finished up our series on uh, spiritual gifts, and I hope that uh, you found at least one spiritual gift in that, in that bunch of gifts. If you didn't, go back and read them and study them again. Pray. Maybe you just haven't discovered it. Maybe you haven't uncovered it yet. Maybe it's laying dormant and it needs to be cultivated a little bit. So pray that you would find that and begin to use that. But today, we're going to start on discipleship lessons. And I've been thinking about when to start this. So I thought, man, we might as well start on Tuesday morning. Thank you for a good crowd out this morning. Wow, what a great crowd out. And uh, But discipleship lessons are things, really, you said, what, what are discipleship lessons? To be discipled means to be trained, to be taught. And we, when somebody gets saved... The next thing needs to happen is they need to be trained, they need to be taught. You know, I said Wednesday, uh, Sunday night, we were talking about that. All these new people are getting saved and rededicated and come to the church. Many of them have absolutely no church background. Right. May not have been raised in a Christian home, may not have been raised in a Christian family, may not have had any knowledge of, of really what the Bible says. They know they needed to be saved. The Spirit of God spoke to them. They opened their heart and got saved. But now they need to be trained. You say, well, great, where are they? Well, I don't know. Hopefully they'll be online and catch it sooner, catch it a little bit later. But uh, that's one reason we wanted to do them online so that people could go back and see them. You say, well, I've been saved for years. Then I've got a free pass. I don't need to know anything about it. No, not really, because as I said Wednesday, Sunday night, everybody needs to be refreshed on the basics. Amen. It's so easy to forget the basics. And sometimes we get so wrapped up, we, what's that old saying? We major in the minors and minor in the majors. Right. And, you know, we forget about the basics. And uh, I didn't get my breakfast this morning, baby, and I just felt that it's in there, yes. So, uh, but <clears throat> i got to have breakfast here this morning. I got carried away and forgot to have it. So I'm going to eat while we do our lesson this morning. Is that okay? But anyhow... We all need lessons on the basics. We'll be discussing a lot of the very basic things. Salvation is where we're going to start. That's a big, big, big lesson. A big. I got water. Thank you. And uh, got to shake my breakfast up. But anyhow, that's where we're going to start is on salvation. We'll be talking about prayer. We'll be talking about assurance. We, we may go back and talk a little bit about baptism again, church attendance, 
giving again, uh, soul winning. I mean, discipleship will take in a whole just group of, of topics that we need to know about. So let me just say this this morning. We're going to start on salvation. I want to say that salvation is the greatest thing that's ever happened to any of us. Can I, is that an amen? amen. I mean, I mean, uh, Miss, uh, Miss Glenn has got her great granddaughter here and, and that's great. Ernie just had a grandbaby. That's great. I mean, he's been sending me pictures where she's absolutely beautiful. I think she looks like Carreri. I have to just tell you that. And you're not going to argue with that, are you? But, uh, you know, I mean, you know, uh, Big D just got back from visiting his daughters and grandchildren up there. And, you know, that's great. Having a job is great. Having money in the bank is great. Having a husband or a wife is great. But you know what? The greatest thing that's ever happened is that we were saved. Amen? Amen. That's the greatest decision you'll ever make. And never forget that. Everything else is secondary. Sometimes we get that order mixed up you know i used to tell people there's really three f's that you can put your life in order with faith family and fortune so many times we get those mixed up sometimes you know if you want to start a month faith in god with jesus christ being safe got to be number one family needs to be number two you're ministry or your work for the Lord, your fortune needs to be on down in there. But faith, your personal relationship has to be number one. Amen? Amen. From the time you got set, got saved until the time you die, you're going to continue to grow. If you don't grow, you'll be like these babies. You know, there's, we don't want anybody to stay a baby Christian. But you know what? We've got a lot of people that are immature. They've never grown. They've never been disciplined they've never been discipled they've never been really taught i had a lady one time years ago came to our church and she kept coming she kept coming she kept finally she took membership she said preacher i want to tell you something she said i love coming to your church because you tell me how to live the christian life well that's what we're supposed to do after you get saved you're supposed to be told and taught and discipled on how to live the christian life and listen i want to say to you this morning don't ever get over getting saved if you ever get over getting saved, you need to make another trip to the altar. And you need to get that wood dried out and get on fire for the Lord again. Because you should never get over being saved. It's the biggest, greatest thing that's ever happened to any of us. Because if you're a Christian, you realize you've been saved from hell. We talk about salvation and, and being saved. And you know, there, there will be people that you will meet that won't even know what that means, be saved. They'll say, well, what's that? What I need to be saved from. They, they, they don't understand that they're lost and in need of a Savior. So what, what they've got to do is be realize you get saved, you get saved from hell. Amen. Amen. That's why Jesus came. He didn't come to, to make you rich or to make your fortune or to give you good health or that, that you'd never have any problems. We went over that Sunday night. We hammered that again Sunday night. Being saved does not exempt you from problems. Being saved doesn't give you a pass from disease. You've still got to live in this world. There's still a devil that's going to be after you. Amen? Amen. But so being saved does not, does not eliminate all your problems. Being saved takes care of the number one problem. Saving you from hell. That's the greatest thing. I don't want to go back and, 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 and dwell on this long because if I do, I won't get past it. God created the heaven and the earth, Genesis 1 1. You believe that? Amen. God created them, Adam and Eve. You believe that? Yes. From them, everybody has come along. Right. Nobody's fallen out of the sky. Nobody's crawled out from under a rock. Nobody's been hatched from an egg. Right. We all got here the same way. God created them, Adam, Adam and Eve. He already had the angels. You know, there are different orders of angels, cherubim, seraphims, archangels. There are different orders of angelic beings. Satan himself was Lucifer, one of the top angels. So when you think, by the way, he was a music director too, don't forget that. No wonder music is such a problem in churches today because he was the first music director. So naturally he would use that to help cause problems in a church today. But you got to realize, though, you know, Satan fell, and, and many of the angels, a third of the angels fell with him. 
But we don't see that repeated. That was that was a one time thing. They were created beings. They were created to serve God. Those angels, outside of that one opportunity that Satan deceived them and pulled them away, that's their job. God created created Adam and Eve to love Him, to serve Him, to choose to obey Him. It, listen, if you don't have a will, you're a robot. God has robotic beings, we could call them. They're angels. They stand around the throne. They worship God continuously. God is looking for people that would willingly choose to love and obey Him. Amen? And that's why we were created. People say, why was man created? To love and serve God. To bring glory to God. Amen? Amen. So don't think that being saved is going to eliminate all your problems. It's not. You just need to learn to glorify God. It saves you from hell. Being saved doesn't stop doubts from coming into your mind. You know, we had a lady that was saved just the other day, and she said, you know, I'm having doubts. Well, that's that's normal. Really, I say use doubts positively. You never had doubts before you got right. saved. You know, you, when, when you were lost on your way to hell, you never doubted whether you were saved. Right. Satan lies to people. He tells unsaved people they can't get saved, and then he tells saved people that you didn't get saved. It's either which side of the fence you're on. The Satan never bothered me when I was lost. He just let you. He let let you go. But as soon as you get saved, you're starting where you know you know you didn't get saved. It's too hard. You've sinned too much. All that stuff. Something else getting saved doesn't it doesn't stop temptation. Anybody been tempted lately? It would admit it. Thank you. I'd admit it. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're, we we all get tempted. It's not a sin to be tempted. Now, boy, sometimes it can be it can be pretty heavy. That it seems like it, it's right on the verge of being sin, but it's only sin when you give into it. Jesus was tempted, yet without sin. So you're going to continue to be tempted. You say, "Well, I didn't think I'd be tempted." Wow! When you get saved, you really get tempted because Satan's trying to keep you from being what he wants you to be. It doesn't exempt you from storms or trouble. So you've been saved from the wrath of God. That's what that's what salvation is. Is being saved from hell and eternity to be able to go to heaven and live there forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. You've been saved from that. Now that you're saved, you need to grow. You need to grow. And people, people, new converts don't understand that. I think people think they get saved and they're just automatically a mature Christian. No. Ernie's got that granddaughter. I can, I guarantee you, she's beautiful. She looks like a Carreri. She's healthy as she can be. But she can't walk yet. Can she? She's just a, a month old. She can't walk. She can't even talk. She can't even crawl. It's a process. And we as, as older Christians, mature Christians, we need to give grace to people that got saved. No, we don't condone sin. We don't tolerate sin. Look at anybody. He's back there showing the picture. <laughs> old grandpa got the picture out, man, back there showing it around. You know, they got the proud grandpa. Just hap- it just happened to come up, huh? Yeah, yeah. You, you, you begin to act more like a woman. You begin to act like a woman. That's how women are. You know, I, I did that too after I started having grandkids and stuff, pulling them up and the phone say, look here. You think, well, I wouldn't do that, but you do do that. But, you know, but people got to grow in the Lord. Amen? Amen. And, and when you think about that, that's what these lessons are for. I believe there are people that have absolutely been saved that just never were trained. I believe that. They don't know any better. They don't know what the Bible teaches on certain topics, on certain subjects, but they were genuinely saved. I believe there are people that said they got saved that weren't saved. They made a false profession. But, you know, I believe people genuinely be saved, but they're still babes in Christ. And you need to be disciples. So don't think that just because you've been saved that you don't need these lessons. You need them. I need them. Amen? Amen. Now, let me say that. We're going to talk about salvation. I need to finish my breakfast. There's one thing you need to understand. Dr. Hudson, Curtis Hudson said one time, if there's one doctrine in the Bible that I wish that, that I should know above all else, it's the doctrine of salvation. 
if there's one thing you need to understand, it's salvation. It's one of the most confused topics in the Bible today. In fact, if you would ask, I'd, I'd be afraid to ask some of you. Unless you've been here for a while and you've heard what we've said over and over and over and over and over. How can somebody be saved? And if you go out on the street out there and go up and down and start knocking on doors and that, how can you be saved? How do you know you're going to have, you might get a, you might get eight or nine or ten different answers. Right. Well, there's not eight or nine or ten different answers. There's one answer. There's one answer biblically. So if there's one doctrine that you need to know more than anything else, it's the doctrine of salvation. Amen. So when you think about that, you know, Satan has caused a lot of confusion. There are a lot of misconceptions. I'm going to address this. This will not be a one-week, one-and-done lesson. I want to address some of those misconceptions. I want to address some of those things, false ideas about salvation. We need to know what the Bible says. There are people that you probably know in your family, your friends, that are lost and on their way to hell. You might be the last roadblock the last stop sign on the way to hell. That's why you need to have some of these. That's why you need to get some of those Romans roads. That's why you need some of those gospel tracts. Because you never know. You never know how the Spirit of God works in somebody's heart and may turn the topic and all of a sudden you realize, hey, this person needs to be saved. So, you know, know about salvation. This is one thing you should be biblically correct about. I wish everybody was. But we got people, we got churches and denominations that are wrong. That they're, they're biblically wrong because they have not rightly divided the Word of God because they've added their part into it. I've known Baptist people that are wrong about salvation. I asked a preacher one time years ago, I asked him this question. Years ago, I was a young preacher, and I wanted to know the answer to this. And I asked him a question. I said, hey, I said, does a, does a person have to be a member of a church to be saved? And he said, well, and I knew right there what his answer was going to be. Do you have to be a member of a church to be saved? No. No. Do you even have to be baptized in water to be saved? No. I had a guy one time, and, and you know, he come, he come out of, I don't know, well, I think I knew where he came from, but I'd ask him about how, how do you be saved, and it's almost like he dropped down a scroll. You have to do this, 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 this. And then you're saved. I thought, wow. It's no wonder he's not out being a soul winner. I don't know what he'd do to put up on a car wreck or be in the hospital and somebody's about to die. I said, wait a minute, hold on. Hold another breath. I've got 25 things to tell you here that you got to do. By the way, the thief on the cross did none of those. Amen. He did none of those, so we're going to talk about that. So I hope this lesson will help you to grow and that you will share it with others. So let's start on the doctrine of salvation. The doctrine of salvation. Let me say, starting out, number, and this is not number one, this is still introduction. God wants people to be saved. Amen. Now there's a teaching out that's called easy believism. And I'm be, be honest with you, I've heard about that for year, 20, 30 years, I've People say, well, too, you make it too easy to be saved. Well, let, me, let, me, let me see if I understand this correct. We want to make it hard to be saved? No. Is, is that what we want to do? I mean, God loved us. Jesus died on the cross. He did it all. Right. You don't spell salvation D-O. You spell salvation D-O-N-E. Right. Jesus did all the hard work. Jesus did all the tough stuff. Amen. He's the one who died and bled and rose again. And people say, well, you know, that easy believism. You just believe people can, can believe and be saved. Well, let's find out what the Bible says about that. But the Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, jot this verse down. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. Well, I like this next part. But is long suffering to usward. Not willing, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know what God's plan is? That everybody could be saved. 
everybody won't be saved, but in God's plan, God wants everybody saved. God's made the provision for everybody to get saved, and everybody could get saved. It's your choice that would keep you from not being saved. So when we think about that, you know, we think about people sometimes. You may have somebody in your family right now you're thinking about, and you think, well, <laughs> well they can't get saved. They can get saved. Everybody can be saved, and we're going to talk about that. So let's get the idea that God has about salvation. We'll become soul winners when we begin to realize everybody can be saved. Now, if you've got your list out there and you're checking your list off, well, I think if they've done this, they can't be saved. Well, they've committed the top three big sins. Well, they can't be saved. Or, well, they've sinned so long that they can't be saved. Or they've gone so far down that they can't be saved. Then you're not going to be a soul winner. You've got to get the same mindset that God has. And that mindset is that everybody can be saved. So Amen. this lesson today will answer just some basic questions about salvation. Here's number one. Who can be saved? Everybody. Now, if you'd ask some people that, they, would, they wouldn't say everyone. Everyone can be saved. Amen. Now, if you'd ask some people about that, they'd say, well... Everybody but, or everybody except. The Bible teaches, you know what the Bible teaches? That anyone can be saved. Whosoever. Let me read you some verses. I'm going to read you some verses, and let's get the biblical answer on who can be saved. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That says, who's that say can be saved? Whosoever. Whosoever. Romans 10, 13. We use that in our, in our invitation all the time. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who is a whosoever? It's a whosoever. That's not just me, you, my people, your people, American people. That's anybody. Whosoever, Revelation twenty two seventeen, and the Spirit and the Bride say, "Come, and let him that heareth come, and let him that is the thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely." No one. Let me say it again. Let me say it again. Point number one. Who can be saved? Anybody. Anyone. Whosoever. Nobody is beyond the grace, the love, the reach, the mercy of God. Amen. Now, I'm going to say this to you, and this will probably will offend you. When you go home this morning, go look in the mirror and say to yourself, Wow, if God can save me, he can save anybody. Right. If God can save me. He can save anybody because nobody is beyond the reach of God. But Satan puts that lie in not only in, in, in Christian people's minds, but especially in unsaved people's minds. Yep. You know how many people that are sitting there during an altar call that want to get saved, but Satan is feeding them lie after lie? I don't, can you remember how it was when you were lost? Lie after, well, you can't, you know, you can't go. People laugh at you. People make fun of you. You've sinned too much. You, God can't forgive you for that. It can't be that easy. The preacher's lying to you. They're trying to, I mean, it's just lie after lie after lie. I remember one time back years ago, years ago, we're having a big Easter service and I, and, and with a bunch of unsaved people and I said something, I said in the altar, I said, you know, if Satan is telling you a lie not to come, you ought to come right now and be saved. Man, here come a guy out of there. He, hey, he said, Satan's talking, telling me all kind of stuff. And come up through there and got saved. So, listen, I'm going to use the term, and I hope this, I hope you understand. We're not Calvinist. Calvinists believe in predestination. They believe that God has predetermined this side's going to be saved and this side's going to be lost. And nothing that you can do about that will change that. Well, let me ask you a question. Does God know who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved? Yes. Yeah, he knows it all. God has predestined, predetermined that everybody can be saved. But he hasn't said, you're going to be saved, you're going to be lost. 
you're going to be saved, you're going to be lost. That's not the way it worked. It works. I'm not Calvinist. Calvinist teaching is infiltrating the Baptist churches today at an alarming rate. You may have people that are Calvinists. Listen, I'm not saying they're not saved. Don't, don't misunderstand that. We're not Calvinist. The Bible teaches that whosoever... You know what that word whosoever means? It didn't say whosoever God called or determined or picked or chose. That It says whosoever. The Bible means whosoever. Amen? So if somebody says, well, are you Calvinist? Is your pastor Calvinist? Absolutely not. We're whosoever. We believe that anybody can be saved. We believe that we need to share the gospel with everybody. We believe that everybody has the opportunity to be saved. We don't believe that you've been predestined for heaven or hell. We don't believe the Bible teaches that. We believe the Bible teaches that whosoever will. That's what I just read, read all those verses. Amen. Now, point number two. When can you be saved? When can you be saved? You can only be saved at church. You can't. You, 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 you don't have to be in the church building to be saved. No. When can you be saved? You can be saved any time. Point number one. Who can be saved? Anyone. When can you be saved? Any time. The Bible teaches that a person can be saved any time they hear the Word of God, believe that, and receive it into their hearts, they can be saved. The Bible says today, Hebrews 3, 7, 8, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Today, 2 Corinthians 16, 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, I've heard thee in the time except in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You can be saved any time you choose. When you receive by faith Jesus Christ, Revelation 3.20, Jesus, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and does what? Open the door, I will come into him. When you open your heart up and receive him, and you say, now wait a minute, wait a minute, preacher, wait a minute. You're telling me that people can get saved any time they want. But I've heard people say that you can only get saved when the Spirit of God is drawing you and calling you. How do you reconcile that? Jesus said in John 6, 44, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. Here's how I'm, I'm going to make it real simple for you today. There ain't nobody that's ever wanted to get saved that the Spirit of God was not drawing them. The only reason people ever want to get saved is because the Spirit of God is drawing them. You say, I don't know if I believe that. Well, give me, let me give you some verses. Romans 3, verse 10, 11, 12. Romans 3, 10, 11, 12. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. Look at verse number 11. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Say that with me. There is none that what? Seeketh after God. Verse 12, they're all gone out of the way and together have become, un they've become unprofitable. There's not a person here, you, me, nobody out on the street, that has ever wanted to come to Jesus on their own. Mankind left alone. If God doesn't intervene, if God doesn't intrude, if God doesn't come and knock on your heart's door and give you an awareness and begin to draw you, you would go farther and farther and farther and farther until you ended up in hell. Right. You say, well, you know, I just thought I finally came to the... I finally thought I got smart enough to figure it out. No, you didn't get smart enough to figure it out. God began to work in your heart. Right. God began to draw you. God began to speak to you. You began to have a realization, I need to be saved. Amen. That's not because you finally just figured it all out. What happened is that there's a Spirit of God that works in people's heart that draws them. You say, I don't know if I believe that. Well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever talked to anybody that was absolutely opposed to being saved? Yes, if you've ever asked for a man, listen, they'll fight you, they'll argue, they'll cuss you, they'll run from you, they'll slam the door in your face. They're absolutely, totally opposed right. to being saved. 
But have you ever met somebody that when you met them, that, that all of a sudden, man, something has changed? And they begin to be interested in the things of God. They begin to have this desire to want to know. You say, what happened? What was the difference? You tell me. God drawing them. If God didn't draw us and bring us to him, we'd not never get saved. Not never. Boy, that's terrible English. And Lorena sitting back there staring me down on that one. Not never. But it's understandable though. We'd not never get saved. If not for the drawing power of God in our lives. Amen. Because the Bible teaches we don't seek after God. Mankind left to his own wanders farther and farther and farther away from God. That's why sometimes we use this and it's a, it's an easy excuse. People say, oh, we shouldn't say anything to somebody about getting saved. We might drive them away. Where are you going to drive them to? They're already away. Every day they're getting farther away. Every day they're getting closer to hell. Every day they're getting closer to dying. Every day they're getting closer to eternity. Every day they're getting closer to judgment. But yet we say, oh no, wait a minute, just don't say anything to them. We may drive them away. Well, I'm sure if you do it the wrong way, you could. But understand, understand point number two that when can you be saved? Anytime. Any time, because you wouldn't want, you wouldn't ever want to be saved if God wouldn't work it in your heart. The natural man has no desire when that spiritual part died, when Adam and Eve sinned and they died spiritually, that spiritual part has to be born again. That spiritual part is the God part. That spiritual part is the part that wants to long and desire and seek after God. It's dead. Deadness can't do anything. You know, somebody said, you, you ever go to a funeral home and sometimes back home we'd go and there'd be a body in this parlor and a body in that parlor and a body in that parlor. And you go by and say, oh, those folks are dead. And then you go to the next room and say, well, he's deader. And then you go to the next room, well, he's the deadest. No, they're all dead. And that's the way it is when people don't know the Lord. They're dead in trespasses and sin. Point number three. You, you still with me? Where can you be saved? Where? Anywhere. Anywhere. Who can be saved? Anyone. When can you be saved? Anytime. Where can you be saved? Anywhere. You say, I don't know if I believe that. Acts 3, there's a crippled man at the the gate when when Peter came by. Was touched. The Ethiopian eunuch in Acts number 8 was riding, reading the book of Isaiah and got saved. The apostle Paul got saved on the Road to Damascus. I mean, the Philippian jailer in Acts 16 got saved after the jail broke open. You can get saved anywhere. We've got this idea, well, if they're not in church, they're not going to get saved. Let me ask you a question just today. How many people got saved and you got saved not in church? Wow, there's one, two, three, hold on. One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's about ten people right here that that were not in church. Did you really get saved then? You weren't in church. Yes. You don't have to be in church to get saved. You can get saved anywhere. But the devil tells us, you know, we gotta we gotta get them to church and get them saved. Well, it, there's nothing wrong with getting them to church, get them saved. The only problem is they might die before they get to church. And then they might come to church and not, not even be an altar call given. There may not even be an opportunity to somebody. They may take and go to church where they don't even give an altar call. They might go to church where nobody even tells them about being saved. We try to make some kind of plea every service to let people know how to be saved. People need to know how to be saved. And you can be saved anywhere. There's no set time or set place where you can be saved. People have been saved. You know, people say, well, I don't know. I don't know. Well, listen, you believe people could be saved at a car wreck? You believe people will be saved in the hospital? You believe people will be saved at their home? You believe people will be saved on the job? Yeah, that's why we need to realize. In fact, we, you just testified to the fact. Almost half of our people were saved outside of the church building. That's why one-to-one soul winning is important. That's why, as Sebby calls it, marketplace evangelism. Wherever you are. 
sharing the gospel. That's why we need to reach people one person at a time. Because the, the majority of people, if we would go back, to, probably many of the majority of people have been saved outside the doors of the church. Am I right? So, good. Point number four. So we're, we're moving along. What, a, what, a, what to do to be saved. What to do to be saved. Here we go. We're going to get right down to it. What to do to be saved. It's not just anything or any way. You can't just do anything. Or, well, I'm going to be sincere. Well, that won't save you. Well, I'm going to believe. What are you going to believe in? Well, I, I, I trust. Well, what are you trusting in? Well, I'm sincere in what I believe. What are you, well, what, what is, what are you sincere in? Because I'm going to say again, if you ask 10 people, I hope if we'd ask 10 people right here, we'd get the same answer. I'm not sure we would, but I hope we would. I hope as time goes on, we'd all be on the same page. But I can guarantee if you go down the street, go to Walmart and stand and ask people, do an interview. I'd like to interview. How do you, how do you think somebody gets saved? Wow. 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 It's no wonder people aren't being saved. People have made it hard. God didn't make it hard to get saved. Jesus didn't make it hard to get saved. The Bible didn't make it hard to get saved. But boy, I tell you what, people have done a good job of making it hard to get saved. Well, you know, maybe you've done this. Maybe not. Let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says, let me tell you what you got to do. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus. That's what you got to do. You got to believe on Acts 16, 30, and 31. It's talking about the Philippian jailer. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what, listen, it doesn't get any plainer than this. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Well, you got to, you got to be baptized. You got to take church membership. You got to have communion. You got to wash the saints' feet. You got to go to church three out of four Sundays a month. You can't miss Wednesday night service. You can't ever slip up. You have to be perfect. I mean, do you realize that's what people tell people? If somebody come up and said, how, how can I be saved? That, there are people that would roll that list out and say, that's what you got. When that Philippian jailer said, hey, what must I do to be saved? You know what they said? Believe on the Lord Jesus. Amen. Believe on the Lord Jesus. Believe. You say, well, that's pretty easy. Yes, it is. But I tell you what, it's hard to get people to surrender and get to that point. If I asked Dennis Fish about that and he was lost as a goose, I'm going to shake him here in a minute. Hey, hey, if I ask him about he said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to catch the biggest crappie. That'll, that'll, that'll help me get saved. You know, and ask somebody else. I asked Cliff, he said, well, I'm going to kill the biggest deer and bring it in. Well, that, that, that'll help me get saved. And, you might ask Ernie, and Ernie said, I'm going to build the biggest house over on the coast, and that will help me get saved. And Bill might say, I spent 24 years in the Coast Guard. That's, no, none of that stuff's going to help you get saved. That's Why is it man wants to put his hands on it and think there's something that he has to do? You need to believe on the Lord Jesus. Let me give you another verse. John three eighteen. He that, anybody know that verse? Believeth. Is on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. What's it say? He that believeth on him, talking about Jesus. John three thirty six. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. John one twelve. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. When you believe, you receive. When you believe. You receive. When you believe, you receive. But you, you know what believe? It? Believe that means, well, I, I, you know, Pastor Brooks texts me a couple times. Is it raining? Is it raining? Is it raining? No. I, he, must be, he must have thought, he must have had the idea, I believe it's going to rain at your house today. He said, well, hold on, it's coming. That's not Bible belief. That's not Bible believing. Well, I believe it's going to be a good day today. That's not Bible believing. Well, I believe that uh, I'm going to get home safe today and not be in a car wreck. That's not Bible believing. That might be hoping, might be praying for those things. You know what that means? To, to, it, here's what Bible believing is. And you, every one of you, practiced it today. 
always like this illustration because it's so true. Every one of you demonstrated Bible belief right here today. I watched you. You said, I didn't, I didn't know I'd demonstrate any Bible. You did. You came right in and sat down in those pews and not, not nary one of you got down to make sure the legs hadn't been sawed off. <laughs> not one of you got down and crawled up down through here to make sure that the pastor didn't come in early and cut the legs off of that seat. You know what you did? You came in and you said, that's a chair. I trust that's a chair. I believe that's a chair. I'm going to depend on that chair. I'm going to rely on that chair. And I'm going to sit down in it. That's exactly what believing in Jesus is. That you believe He is who He is. That He was who He said He was. That He is going to do what He's going to do. That He can save you if you can just believe Him. Amen. You know Why is it you can come in... Why did you come in and sit down in a seat and not even... Do you realize how heavy these pews are? Why? They, they could kill you. But you didn't, you didn't check it because it's a chair and a pew. That's its job. Jesus is Jesus and He's a Savior and that's His job. But yet you say, would you believe on the Lord Jesus? Well, uh, but this or but that or except that's... If you if you got all that, you're not believing on Jesus. If you can believe on Jesus, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Savior of the world. Jesus died on the cross at Calvary. Jesus was buried in a borrowed tomb. Jesus rose from the grave. Jesus is coming back someday. If you can believe on just sit down in Him and relax. Amen. Trust Him. Amen. Depend on Him. That's what Bible believing is. Listen to Romans 10. 9 through 13. These are soul winning verses. Listen to, listen to how many times you hear this word. Begin in verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse 10. For with the heart man believeth under righteousness, and with the mouth confession of man is salvation. Verse 11, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Verse 12, for there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek. That takes in everybody in the world. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Then verse 13, for whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what you got to do to be saved. Is believe on Jesus. He said, "That's simple. Try to get unsaved people to do that." Man, they want to believe on. They want to believe in their name. They want to believe in their job. They want to believe in their family. They want to believe in how good they've been. Well, I've not really been that bad. I've been. A, listen, that's not. It's not about. That's not about all that. Everybody we meet is either saved or lost. There's not any in-between. We try to put everybody in the world. Maybe there's an in-between. There's no in-between. Either saved or you lost. When the Titanic went down and they put that list up over there in the, in the ship line, in, in the office of the ship, they had two columns. Guess what it said? Saved on one side, lost on the other side. It's the same way with salvation. Everybody we meet, everybody we talk to, they're either saved or lost. Wow. Wow. People just, you say, well, why won't people be saved? And well, I'm going to give you a couple of things. Sometimes, and i got to hurry up, sometimes we think it's the number of our sins. Is it the number of your sins that keep you from being saved? No. no. Is, it the, is it the severity no. of your sins that keep you from being saved? No. We've got a lot of reasons why we think the devil tells us that. You've committed too many sins. I've had people, listen, I've had people tell me that's lived their whole life. Have you ever heard this? This is the stupidest thing that you could ever hear. And I know I'm not supposed to say that. But people say, well, I've been lost my whole life. I'm not going to get saved now. Wow. Yeah, so we're going to go out into eternity. And they don't know anything about eternity. They don't know anything about the doctrine of hell. They don't know anything about being lost and away from God. How pompous and how much pride. Well, I've been lost for 60 years. I ain't going to get saved now. 
I ain't going to get saved now. I've been lost. I didn't need God my whole life. So I'm just going to go ahead and be lost till I die. Wow. That, you're talking about the epitome of stupidity. That's somebody that doesn't know what, that's somebody that know anything about the Bible. So when you think about that, you say, well, then why aren't people saved? Here's a couple of reasons the Bible says why people, because they won't believe. John 8, 24, Jesus said, I said, therefore, unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. You know what Jesus said? The reason people die and go to hell because they will not believe in Jesus Christ. That's, the, that's what gets you. They will not believe. And then he said in John 5, 40, another reason, and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. Not only will they will not believe, they will not come to Jesus. If you're not going to believe, you're not going to come. That young lady Sunday morning said, man, I just felt like I need to step out and come down. That's God drawing you. That's the Spirit of God drawing you. You wouldn't come if you didn't believe that. You wouldn't walk down in front of a church full of people if you didn't believe God's going to save you. So, you know, Jesus said, you won't believe on me. You're going to die in your sins. You won't come to me that you might have life. And then he said in John 3, 19, here's it. People love darkness more than light. Wow. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. There are people that enjoy their sinful lifestyle. There are people that would rather remain in their sins than come to Jesus. There are people that would rather do that and give up what they're doing than come to Jesus. And the Bible says there's pleasure in sin. And is there anybody can deny? There's pleasure in sin for a season. I mean, listen, listen. Why do you think there's so many people out there running around and doing what they do? Because, man, listen, there's pleasure in that for a while. But if you can live long enough, that'll get old. Beauty will fade. Your body will wear out. What you thought was once exciting can become very unexciting. What you thought used to bring you joy can bring you sorrow. But the devil tempts people with that, man. Because, listen, man, the, you, you, do you ever, you ever hear people say, man, I ain't come to church. Man, I know I ain't come to church. Man, I'm, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. That's why we need to take the gospel to them. That's why we need to share the gospel to them. There's only one sin that will send you to hell. There's only one sin that will send you to hell. You say, well, I know what it is. It's adultery. No. Well, it's, it's bank robbing. No. It's murder. No. There's only one sin that's unforgivable. And it's not accepting Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. That's the sin that causes people to be lost. They want to put their sins, I've got too many, I've done too much, it's been too bad. It's that one thing is they can not accept Jesus and believe Him and receive Him. And therefore, if you choose to not accept Jesus and you don't accept God's plan of salvation, there is no salvation. There's not going to be another way. There's not going to be another plan. There's not going to be another option. There's not going to be another Jesus that's going to come down. There's not going to be somebody where we got all these false preachers telling you all this crazy stuff. The Bible said there's one way and that's Jesus. And mark it down. If you don't go by Jesus, you don't go. And you know what? You can be, there's some people that are better members of a church than they are better Christians. Because the church might say, well, you need to do this, you need to do that. And they say, well, I did all that. I joined, I've been confirmed and affirmed, and I've gone through catechism, and I've been sprinkled, and I've been blown on, and I've been dunked, and I've, you know, I've, I was baptized as a baby. I've done all these things. They, you, you might do everything the church says and still die and go to hell. Amen. Because you did not accept Jesus Christ. I told a story about Howard. Howard was a guy that had his legs shot off in World War II, the German invasion. Probably should have died, probably, but he didn't end up losing his leg. End up coming to a little town in Calhoun County from Bradenton, Florida, over there. 
come up there, started coming to church, had a hot dog weenie roast one day. He come to the weenie roast. He called me, said, man, I got to talk to you. I got to, he said, man, I got to talk to you. Something's going on. Howard got saved. Howard had been a member of a church and was an officer in the church. He said, I, was a, I had this position in the church, lost as a goose in a hailstorm, because he had never been saved. Over the next several weeks, we're going to dig down and dig out what the Bible says about salvation. Amen. The best thing I can say to you that are here this morning, you that are online watching, you that will watch later on, is more than anything else. Know that there's been a point in time that you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen. You say, well, preacher, it's been so long, I can't remember the exact day or the hour. If you, listen, if you can't remember the day or the hour, you need to know there was a time that you got saved and asked Jesus to come into your heart. It, listen, eternity is too long to be wrong. Well, I'm trusting that mommy did it for me. And I'm trusting I did it as a baby. And I'm trusting that I'll do it when I get older. I'm trusting that. No, 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 no. Eternity is too long to be wrong. Thousands of people. Listen, think about this. Thousands of people are going to die today. Or are we going to be in that group? You don't know. You could be. You could be. We can be at your funeral home tonight. You hear what Trevor, how many would listen to Trevor Sunday night? Boy, isn't that, isn't that amazing? 16-year-old boy. Wanted to play college baseball. Oh, he, he was, you can tell he's a handsome young man. Wow. Just a, just a great kid. Loved to hunt. Loved to play ball. And was in a tree stand and fell out and paralyzed. And he's 24 years old. That's one third of his life. I thought to him, that's one third of his life he's been in a wheelchair. And God is using him. God is using him to reach people. I don't know if you can tell. You see the strap on him? You see the strap on him? What a great young man. What a great young man. And boy, I tell you what. Wow. God, can, God will use you. God will use you. Thank God for Trevor. You know, you can either be bitter or you can be better. Trevor, as a young man, has chosen to be better. Amen. Well, I hope you're saved today. I hope you'll come out and be with us. Cliff, don't forget, it's your birthday today. Happy birthday, buddy. And more than you not forgetting, don't forget it. It, it surely would forget that. Wow. And then Julie and Kevin have your anniversaries was yesterday. I knew it was yesterday. Well, yeah, we put on on Facebook yesterday. Happy anniversary to you. Is he watching? A Mason. My man Mason, buddy. Happy birthday, buddy. God bless you. I miss you today, buddy. So happy birthday to you. We're going to get off here. Say goodbye. Thank you for being on. You're a great crowd. Amen.